Hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining me for this video. I'm going to do a podcast. I'm so glad that you are here. If you're watching on YouTube, I'm going to put the description or a link to the article that I'm going to share with you. So if you want to read uh, this article, just hit the link uh, in the description on YouTube. And also uh, that link will take you not just to the article, but also to this podcast that I'm about ready to record. So you can read, you can watch, or you can listen. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm going to talk about why unkind and unfair judgments can have so much management or so much control over us. Thanks again for joining me for the video. How do you feel when inconsiderate people say unkind things about you? I mean, if you're like me, it stings just a little bit. It's exceptional for a person to shrug off uncharitable comments like completely and sometimes in these unsavory moments, sometimes a person will throw up Matthew 7, 1 like an impulsive shield to the unkindness. You know what Matthew 7, 1 says, judge not that you be not judged. And we can impulsively miss out on the moment of what God is doing in our lives and just automatically throw up this verse, by the way, out of context as a defensive mechanism. That text is not our best defense against unfair judgments. There is another way, a gospel-oriented mindset, that becomes our soul's most potent anchor against those who are unkind toward us, which begs the question for this podcast. If someone's unkind words manage our emotions, then what are we missing? Why do we give them that kind of power over us? Hello, everyone. This is Rick Thomas. You're listening to the Life Over Coffee podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. I am sharing an article with you, and the title of the article is Do Unkind and Unfair Judgments Manage You? If you go to our ministry's website, you will be able to find that article, and in the article, you'll find this podcast, and then you'll also find a video of the article. And so you can choose your medicine. You can read, you can watch, or you can listen. Now, we also discuss, too. We're not just a monologue ministry. And so if you want to interact with us about anything, maybe uh, this topic here, do unkind and unfair judgments manage you? If you want to talk about that, well, we would love to discuss it or anything else that's on your mind. We have free community forums that are provided for you by those who financially support our ministry. All right, so let me get into uh, this article. And again, thank you so much for joining me. One of the most oft-quoted verses in the Bible is Matthew 7.1. Now, that is a phenomenal thing, and I'm not going to get into how people do take it out of context most of the time or why it's so popular, but just think about it. 66 books in the Bible, 1,189 chapters. There's more than 31,000 verses. There's more than 750,000 words. That's a lot of information. And one of the most famous sentences is, judge not that you be not judged. I do find that quite amazing. I mean, I can understand why John 3, 16 or Psalm 23, 1 through 6 is so popular, but Matthew 7, 1, and I trust when someone says something unkind to you that that is not your impulsive defense mechanism. There is a better question that we want to ask, and I want to deal with that question in this podcast. Why does it matter so much when folks judge us harshly? Did you know that how we respond to unkind and unfair judgments reveal a lot about us? I mean, if you want to know what a person believes and who they really are at the core of their being, then just bring some unfair heat into their lives. And they will. it will quickly reveal who they are in the most unvarnished way. But before I get to that, I do want to clarify something about why does it matter when people say unkind things to us. Why does it matter is self-evident. And I do not want to trivialize it. I don't want anyone to think I'm trivializing what unsavory people say or do to us. I'm not. I'm not minimizing that or, or saying it's trite because it's not. When people do say unkind things to us, 
or when we do it, when we are the givers and not the receivers, it does matter. It matters to God when unkind people say rude things about any of his image bearers. And when we judge a person uncharitably, we're taking the creator God's name through the mud. And it's worse if you are a Christian. You see, God adopted us. He made us followers of his son. We belong to him. We are the body of Christ. And so what we say and what we do to the world, well, we are we are. We are broadcasting to the world who God is by the things that we say and do, and so it does matter. Let me give you an illustration. If someone was slandering my son, they would be slandering my name too because we are biologically bound together. And in God's kingdom, he spiritually ties believers to himself. And so when someone mocks or degrades or puts down slanders or gossips about anybody, It is his name that is on the line, not ours, primarily. The Bible does not shy away from directly connecting God with his children. And so when you do something to one of his, it's an offense in heaven. And there is no mistaking this truth. And so whether we're giving or receiving, we should guard our hearts regarding how we speak about other people, other Christians, regardless of what they say or do. But I do want to push it a little bit further and say that there is a universal kindness and respect that we should have toward all people, irrespective of their allegiance to the King of Kings. Because as James talks about in chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, that we're all made in the image of God. And so whether we're Christian or not, we want to be careful about how we communicate to image or communicate about image bearers or to image bearers. But in this podcast, I'm asking a more profound question that is more personal, and it may reveal some things about us that we need to address. I mean, the straightforward temptation is to focus too much on what the other person did or what the other person said. And I understand that. I can succumb to that temptation easily. But when we jump first to what they said or what they did, then we're going to miss a golden opportunity to respond to the Lord by thinking well and reacting appropriately toward that unkind person. I mean, maybe you need to confront that unkind person, but we want to make sure that we address our hearts first so that we will think well and we will respond appropriately to them, even if it is a confrontation. There are times when the Lord brings hardship into our lives for our benefit. And we should not fail this test by not examining our hearts and how a silver lining of grace could transform a strand of fallenness that continues to linger in the darkness of our hearts? And so the big question is, why does it matter when someone makes unkind and unfair judgments about any of us? The more probing question is that if it does matter too much, why do you or why do I give them that much power? Because if it matters too much to where it is controlling us, then we have given them power. We are the ones that permit them to control us. I was thinking about these things, and it reminded me of a podcast that I listened to from This American Life uh, several years ago. I haven't heard uh, This American Life in a long time. It was probably 10 years ago, but uh, there were two or three years where I listened to like every episode And the person at that time, I don't know if he still hosts this podcast, but his name was Ira Glass. And Ira Glass dedicated one particular show to America's middle schools. And one of these middle schoolers' most common repeated remarks was their fear of being judged. That was the most off thing that they said during that entire episode. And I didn't count how many times they talked about the fear of judgment the controlling opinions of other people, but it had to have been two dozen times in a one-hour show. And at each point along the way, I kept asking the same question, why does it matter what anyone is saying about you? Now, ultimately, I felt sorry for these kids. I even grieved for them. They were in a dark bondage that they could not see, and even more heartbreaking, There was a complete lack of awareness of a rescuing Savior. 
I mean, this was not a God-centered program, and so God was not part of the puzzle. God was not part of the solution. They were in bondage to the cravings of their hearts, which convinced them that they must have the approval of other people. The opinions of others controlled how they dressed, how they talked, how they looked, who they hung out with, and even more. Somebody needed to tell these kids about a risen Lord who had conquered our deepest fears and insecurities, especially when people have nasty opinions about them. There is so much help in the gospel, but they were so far from it. A person who gets tripped up over what someone has said about them is a person who does not have a clear and compelling and practical understanding of Jesus' mission on earth. The Savior came to set captives free. And the person who is not living in the freedom of God's redemptive work on the cross will succumb to many things, including the opinions of others all of their lives. We live in a critical, harsh, and uncaring world. We all make mistakes. We receive uh, critical, harsh, and uncaring things, and we have dished it out as well. And if you are a follower of Christ, it's even worse, especially if you've done it as I have, because there are amplifiers out there. There are people in the weeds that are out there ready to amplify anything that we get wrong. Whenever a Christian stumbles, where they're going to be quick to let everybody know, because we're imperfect people living in an imperfect world. And anybody who follows the Savior, and you're following Him imperfectly, and you're leading people, directing people to Him imperfectly, well, I'm not justifying your faults, and I'm definitely not justifying mine, but we should have a sober awareness of our imperfections and a lack of absolute holiness without justification. I'm not justifying our mistakes at all. It comes with the territory. We're in an alien land. We're a work in progress. We're imperfect people. And we're living as foreigners in this unwelcoming world. And so we're going to make mistakes and we're going to say unkind things. And people are going to say unkind things to us. That's just the way it is without justification. And so we want to be mature. We want to rise above that. But not only are we living in this face-to-face -face real world, there's another world too. We live in the internet age, and some people in the cyber world have quick triggers. They are more than willing to tell you where you messed up or where you got it wrong than encourage you for your desire to love God and others more than yourself, even though we do it imperfectly. This trigger effect that I'm talking about is uh, under social psychology. It's actually called the disinhibition effect. The disinhibition effect means that there are people who are they're not afraid to tell someone off because they can hide a million miles away as they pound out disturbing things like keyboard warriors. They're not inhibited. They're never going to see you. They don't care about you, not going to run into you. And so they can be a million miles away and say some of the most uncharitable things. And so we live in the real world, time and space where we hurt people and people hurt us with uncharitable remarks. But we also live in cyberspace too. And so in both of those worlds, it can really complicate our lives if we are bothered by these things more than just a little bit. Now, it does trouble me a little bit. I am not impervious to these things. But if it bothered me more than just a little bit, I wouldn't do much of anything for Jesus. It is unreasonable to expect everybody to prefer me. It's unreasonable to think that people would like me. Actually, it would be self-righteous. Self it would be immature. It would be unbiblical. It would be arrogant to expect people to be okay with me all the time, especially in light of all of my imperfections. I mean, think about this. The Savior was an imperfect man. Living, he was a perfect man. Restate that. He was a perfect man living in a sinful world among imperfect people, and even that formula did not change the outcome regarding criticism, gossip, judgments, and slander toward him. And I'm a long way from being perfect Christ-likeness, and I imagine that you are too. 
And so there is no way that I'm going to get it right without justifying anything that I've done wrong. But people are going to say unkind things whether I get it right or wrong. And so therefore, I have to make sure that I am redirecting and reorienting my mind back to the gospel. And if I don't have that reorientation of the soul through the redemptive work of the gospel, then I will be overcome by what other people say about me. The gospel is not only a steadying influence in our hearts, but it will anchor us toward those uncharitable judgments. And so as you think about the gospel, I, I want to talk about two facets of the gospel. There's so many. The gospel is like a multifaceted diamond. And each turn of that diamond, there's a new facet that, you, that was previously hidden. But just for this podcast and talking about unfair judgments, I want to turn two facets of the diamond. And you may want to buckle your seatbelt for this because this is going to be really strong. Here's facet number one. And by the way, don't turn me off until you hear facet number two because number one is going to sting just a little bit. The gospel says that we are low down, dirty, rotten sinners, rocketing toward hell, and not aware or caring what our eternal destination would be. The gospel says that. That's what the gospel communicates. You can read some of that language in uh, Romans 3, verses 10, 11, and 12, where Paul said that we're worthless. And so it's really strong language as, uh, as far as the gospel's criticism of us. And so that's one facet. Let me turn it again. Here's another facet of the gospel. The gospel further informs us that God stopped us on our pursuit of hell because of his great mercy. And so in this podcast, the gospel has a twofold meaning. One, we were the worst of the worst. Total depravity is what we call it in theological circles. And then two, and now we are the best of the best because Christ has locked us up by his love. He rescued us from eternal destruction. And so we were the worst of the worst, and now we're the best of the best, not because of anything that we have done, but because of our alien righteousness, what he has done to us. My all-time favorite quote on this subject about being humble and transparent amid harsh and harmful judgments is from Milton Vincent from his work, A Gospel Primer. Now, probably many of you have read that book and you benefit from it. I have a link here, by the way, in the article. So if you haven't read it, you can link right here or just go right out to Amazon and get it. But here's, here's my all-time favorite quote from the Gospel Primer, which I'm sure many of you have heard. Quote from Milton Vincent. If I wanted others to think highly of me, I would conceal the fact that a shameful slaughter of the perfect Son of God was required that I might be saved. But when I stand at the foot of the cross and am seen by others under the light of that cross, I am left uncomfortably exposed before their eyes. Indeed, the most humiliating, goss the most humiliating gossip that could ever be whispered about me is blared from Golgotha's hill, and my self-righteous reputation is left in ruins in the wake of its revelations. With the worst facts about me, Thus, exposed to the view of others, I find myself feeling that I truly have nothing left to hide. That was from the pen of Milton Vincent from the book, A Gospel Primer, which I do highly recommend. Milton's thoughts are not the average Christian's practical mindset. It is not how most of us think about God and others. If the unkind words of others matter to the point of managing our emotions, the Vincent quote is not our functional, practical, on the ground, boots on the ground theology. If what they say matters too much, we're making a possible unwitting conclusion that God is not enough for us when it comes to criticism and people's unkind judgments. But Christians know better. Christians should think better than this. The father fully approved his children. But if it matters when someone criticizes us, then we are saying that while we may appreciate God's acceptance, we need more than his approval. I must have people's favorable opinions because 
That's what matters more to me. In Matthew 10, 26 through 28, some more strong language. This is from the Savior. He said, So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. When I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Gospel-centered people live near the cross. And when criticism comes their way, they know what to do with them. They know there is nothing that anyone could say to them that the Lord has not already declared from Golgotha's hill. One glance at the cross, and they experience the great recentering effect of the gospel while not leaning into that wicked craving for someone to like them. Nobody has, nobody has ever made a judgment against them, Christians, that comes remotely close to what God has said about them. God's judgment is infinitely more severe, and the Father has forgiven the Christian. Let that deeply rooted gospel truth sink into your psyche and caress your heart until your soul experiences the refreshing light of your hope in Christ. Do not fear what others say about you if you are a Christ follower. Rather than being offended or hurt or tempted to retaliate with Matthew 7, 1, for example, the gospel-oriented mind may, may even want to listen and possibly learn what they have to say. I'm not speaking of an immediate humble response when unkindness comes because we are fragile image bearers. Let's be reasonable here. It does impact. It does hurt for a moment. Now, maybe you're mature enough to where you can immediately reorient yourself to the gospel and, and think humbly about what is happening at the moment. But most of us aren't the man of steel. I am sure you have found that some of your harshest critics have been messengers, even in aesthetically displeasing packages. And though their methods were unkind, maybe crude or rude or uncharitable, there have been times when you perceived an ounce of truth through their meanness that you could take to heart. If you have not had this experience, then I appeal to you to look a little deeper or find someone to help you learn how to acquire this kind of wisdom. It is rare for someone to confront or criticize me, and it is something that I've never heard before. That would be exceptional. I, I have made all of my mistakes, and so I just make reiterations of the same mistakes over and over again. And if you're more than 20 years old, you, you have set patterns and not all of them are the best version of yourself, as, as they like to say today. What I'm talking about is Christ likeness. And so you have set patterns, a former manner of life is what Paul talked about. And so you have your way about you that can be off putting. You haven't completely transformed into Christ likeness. And that, that means you have been an annoyance toward more than one person, a time or two, as I have. Of course, if you surround yourself with people who always agree with you, then. Uh, you're in pretty deep weeds at that point. And so your response, I'm going to give you a list of questions to help you to really tease out what I've been sharing in this podcast. And these questions that I'm going to ask you are going to give you an objective measurement of, of how far along you are in understanding and applying the gospel to your life practically. If you don't listen to rebukes that people give, whether they're kind or unkind, then you really are in the deep weeds. And so we want to be mature enough. We want to be so centered on the gospel and so managed by the gospel that not only do their opinions, they don't control us, but we're able to look inside of those harsh comments and find areas where we can grow. And then as we make those assessments and as we mature in that opportunity, and then we can respond appropriately to that other person if that is the right call in that moment. And so the title of this podcast is, Do Unkind and Unfair Judgments Manage You? I want to wrap up with a brief call to action. I have four question sets for you, and so let me jump right into them. Question number one, or question set number one, are you more apt to give a defense 
or listen to what they are saying. This is a huge thing. And somewhere in that harsh comment, now maybe it was 99% harsh, but if you could find the 1% and learn from it, then uh, that is a sign of maturity. Again, I'm not saying that you should let what they said go, that you shouldn't confront it. Maybe you should. Maybe if you have the uh, the relationship with them, maybe you could teach them how to bring corrective care to you rather than uh, tying their little notes on rocks. And so are you more apt to give a defense or listen to what they're saying? Are you more adept at finding the strands of truth in challenging to hear confrontations? What do your answers to these two questions reveal about you? How can you change? And then if you would like, you can actually make this a, a homework assignment. Think about your most recent conflict with someone where they said something harsh or unkind to you and see if you can tease out the strands of truth in what they were saying. And then you can further work that out to see how you can maybe come alongside them after you have made the applications to your life. Question set number two. Are you tempted to get angry for their words or be sad about their sinfulness? Now, this is a great question. Perhaps you want to call your anger righteous when you respond to them. Okay, I have an article on that. In fact, it's linked right here if you want to get a, a, a deeper understanding of what righteous anger is. But are you tempted to get angry for their words, let's say righteous anger, or be sad about their sinfulness? My point here is where do you focus first? On the sinner sinning against you or how you are offended even if you are offended righteously? If your instinct is to focus on the speck and not your log, then I would just encourage you to find him. Our first point of focus should be on the sinner sinning because that is a person who is offending the great power, who is offending God Almighty. And so if that is our first focus, that we're sad for them, then we have the focus in the right place. Question set number three, are you more willing to extend grace and mercy to them or to respond similarly to how they responded to you? Now, this question that I'm asking finds its root in the gospel, specifically in Matthew 18, verses 23 through 35. This is the story of the gentleman who was forgiven this great debt, and then he went out and beat up someone who owed him a tiny debt, and then the one who had forgiven him the great debt realized what was going on, and he said, why can't you have mercy on that person as I had mercy on you? We want that kind of gospel-centered attitude. We want to be willing to extend mercy and grace to those. Uh, we don't want to respond the way that they responded to us. And again, I'm not saying that we shouldn't confront them. Confrontation may be in order, but the confrontation should come out of a heart of grief because of their sin, love for them, respect for them because they are image bearers. And then finally, question number four. Is it your default to talk about them to God first or to talk to others about what they said to you? Now, this is a common mistake that many of us make, and I've made it several times in my life as well. My immediate default is probably that I'm not going to talk to God first. I'm going to talk to somebody else. Now, if that is true, well, then there is work that we need to do in our hearts. We want to talk to God first because this is a sinner sinning. We don't want to make it all about us. And so if we make it all about us, then uh, our, uh, we're not going to be willing to extend grace and mercy to them. Uh, we're going to find ourselves retaliating to them and talking to somebody else about them. But if our first impulse is, this is a sinner sinning, therefore I have a heart of compassion for this person who's obviously caught in a trap, therefore I'm going to talk to God first before I talk to anyone else. And so my follow-up is, answer honestly what your response to this question reveals about your understanding and practice of Jesus in your life. The question was, is it your default to talk about them to God first, or talk to others about what they said to you. Your answer to that question will 
give you a lot of information about your understanding and practice of Jesus in your life. The title of this podcast is Do Unkind and Unfair Judgments Manage You? You can read it, you can watch it, you can listen to it. And then if you want to discuss, please jump on our free community forums. We would love to do that. It's the only place in the world where we can dialogue with people because we're just not omnipresent. We can't be everywhere. And I don't want you to fall through the cracks. And so if you want to talk, let's do just that. <music>